I thought we were the protectors of truth. Democrats, Republicans, you all lie. We, a small band of survivors, are on our way to the Steel City to find the resistance. Join us. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance with Senior Airman Ward Miller and the ironclad voice of Pittsburgh Hutch Jr. laying down verbal C4 to blow away the lies and the political tomfoolery. Your papers have been cleared. Welcome to the Steel City Resistance. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Steel City Resistance. My name is Hutch Jr., and I am located deep down in the bunker in the city of Pittsburgh. And I'm Ward Miller, also in the city of Pittsburgh, here in Mission Control. And uh, after last week's uh, triumphant return, I'm so happy to be back. That's good. Sometimes uh, the week takes a long time in between shows, Ward, especially in this silly season that we're in right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll tell you, you uh, you had an announcement for the folks. Something's coming up in October that you wanted to make sure that they didn't uh, that didn't just slip away. We got to have a, a hard copy of this for history. Yeah, everybody, remember to set your DVRs uh, for, for ABC. Martha Radat Radatz Raditz Raditz something like that. I saw her in Iraq. All right, she is going to be the moderator of the VP of debate on October 11th in Danville, Kentucky. This, for comedic value alone, will be worth you setting your DVRs because, you know, Paul Ryan, who is one of the, the best off-the-hip talkers that I've seen in politics lately, is going against Joe Biden, who can't get out of his own way. It is something. I mean, this guy is uh, he's being protected, and they're sticking up for him left and right, and it's just a, an embarrassment to the nation. Or I've also heard that it's a possible – Deliberate distraction. Uh, that's a possibility. Here, here's my thinking. Um, you know, all the Republicans basically called them on it and said, "Hey, you know, if, if they really want a shot at winning, they got to dump Biden, and and uh, Obama's got to run with Hillary." The the downside to that is number one, Hillary's not going to run with Obama. No, no. If, that, if that Hillary ends runs, her Hillary's running for president in 2016. So in in that vein, she'd want. Obama to either a lose or b keep Biden because number one you know the thing is in 2016 there's no way Biden's electable no so I don't uh, think Hillary is either Hillary's getting up in the age she's in her yeah. 70s or she will be in her 70s I, I don't think Hillary has a shot either um, but plus she's Biden, just so repulsive lately I mean well, <laughs> if and, and Biden's out of his mind oh, you know yeah, there's I something mean, wrong with, with him within a week. He, he, you know, he, he can't get out of, that was what I was saying before, he can't get out of his own way. He, uh, he told a bunch of people in Virginia that Paul Ryan and Mitt Romney want to put them back in chains to a predominantly black um, audience. Unbelievable. He's, he said they want to put you all back in chains. Um, he also said that they're trying to take the auto industry into the 20th century. <laughs> And, uh, and I think that they're actually doing that uh, because they're going backwards. And we're going to take North Carolina. Only problem yeah. was he was in Virginia. Exactly. <laughs> you know, he's cheerleading for the wrong place. It, it, it's like, you know, maybe you should write on his hand, you know, you're in Virginia. He'd look at the wrong hand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Pick up laundry. I'll tell you, I, uh, I've had a feeling lately, and it's, uh, it's only grown since Paul Ryan has been added to the ticket. Uh, I think that was, uh, that was something that I was just really terrified that he was going to make the wrong pick. I just knew for sure. I think, I think most of the country was sitting there thinking, oh, man, don't pick one of these duds nobody's ever heard of. You know what I yeah. mean? One of these, uh, I can't even remember their names now. They're so obscure. Well, there was, uh, the, the only real Portman. big name that was floated was uh, Plenty. And to me, he's not even a big name. To me, he's a And he's not a big name. No, but he ran. You yeah, know, he, he, he did. He also ran. He, he could have picked Santorum. I don't know how well that would have played because, know. you know, Santorum was bashing him on the, you know, when they were on the campaign trail. So, I mean, that was kind of like when 
when Ron, when uh, Obama picked uh, Biden, because Biden was on the campaign trail at the time saying, why would you vote for Obama? He has no experience. Yeah, yeah. And then when he wins the nomination, he picks Biden. So, And I think Biden's just a, 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 uh, a, a insurance policy that he doesn't get assassinated. <laughs> I have a feeling that uh, I've been thinking this lately, and I've read some things. This, these aren't uh, my thoughts genuinely all by myself, although I've been thinking about this for a long time, but I've seen it start to materialize a little bit, and, and I think uh, what my gut's been telling me for a year is starting to, starting to get a little bit of a tailwind. And uh, one thing you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, is I've seen a Rasmussen poll, uh, it's probably from Friday, it might be from Saturday, but these things stick around for a couple days. Uh, and that's not really even enough time for the Romney bump to, to really uh, affect the polls. But Romney was up by two. It wasn't Rasmussen, it was Gallup, which which hasn't been nice to Romney. And uh, he's, he's up by two. Now you gotta understand that in 1980, in this period of August, Ronald Reagan was down by nine. Just think about that. Yeah, but I, the last thing I want to do is really compare Romney to uh, Reagan. Reagan no. was was more of a neocon than uh, Romney is. Romney's more of a moderate Republican. Well, I think uh, he's gonna. I think he knows the scope of the problems that we have, and the, oh, absolutely, and the solutions and, to those problems are going to look drastically right-wing, extremely right-wing. They are. It's the only way to do it. And I well, think that's why I picked Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. And and what was funny, Paul Ryan had one of the best quotes ever when they said to him, well, what makes you think that your solution will uh, get us out of debt? And he looked directly in the camera and said, math. <laughs> nice, yeah. No, he's been working on this for a long time. He worked for Jack Kemp when he was young. Oh. Yeah, I mean, he, he's been around. Um, he, he's really, you know, a smart guy. I, I, I agree with you totally. I, I think that was a good pick. I think that was one of the better ones that he, you know, it, there's some, of the, you know, the... Short of uh, Alan West, I don't see how you do better than Paul Ryan. No. Really. I, I, mean, I totally agree. I mean, and Ryan, I mean, the difference is, I think, because if you were to, to take, Alan West is your uh, running mate, you'd be running more strongly on defense, which I don't think is a bad thing, but the economy is so screwed. You need somebody in there that, that knows how to, how to fix the economy. I think Alan West would have been a good pick, but, we Ryan, or, but Romney has to focus on the economy. He has to make everything about the economy. And, you know, the old James Carville thing, it's about the economy, stupid. But the thing and, is, is they managed a brilliant move a jiu-jitsu move uh, that took it off the economy, but amazingly put Medicare in the GOP's favor. When you, when you stand it up against Obamacare and the $716 billion that they siphon off of Medicare and inject directly into Obamacare, and, and that's uh, uh, personified by payments being reduced to doctors, which will, in effect, put hospitals out of business. And in two days, you've been able to articulate that to the point where I understand it. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's that's the bottom line. That's what ends up happening is doctors will end up stop saying, I can't take it. I can't take Medicare anymore. I saw today it said whole hospitals. Yeah. In, in, in the out years, you know, not right away, but in the out years. And he's saying this at the villages. Well, and there's there's plenty of places that have already started that, yeah. where you, you go into a hospital, you know, like a level one trauma, and you're on Medicare or Medicaid or one of them, uh, they'll stabilize you and then send you to another hospital. Yeah. That, because the, it, the way that Medicaid works or Medicare works is ridiculous, because basically what they do is they come in and say, this is how much we're going to pay you for your service. Yeah. Now, a hospital bills you for like an MRI, and, and I think it's like $2,000 or something. Medicare comes in and says, well, we're going to pay you 280 bucks. And that's why the rest of us pay $300 for toilet paper. That's additionally why, yeah, absolutely. And then on on top of that, you have the doctors that have to have $2 million worth of right. uh, malpractice insurance because there's no tort reform and everybody's chomping at the bit to sue a doctor. Yeah, that's true. 
Now, my comparison between uh, wasn't really between Reagan and Romney. My, my comparison was between the State of the Unions, that, except we're much worse today. But if, oh, you, if you recall in 1980, 1980, they even had uh, a metric for measuring the misery factor, you know, oh, yeah. if you'll remember. But uh, I think uh, the same thing that's good. Well, the difference was Carter didn't put as many people on, on welfare true. as Obama has. He would have if he could have, though. Oh, yeah. absolutely. But, I mean, that's that's why the misery factor isn't quite as high. Right. I think what you're going to – and plus, not only that, but the the Federal Reserve is committing national suicide – uh, by just in continuing to inject new dollars, digitizing new dollars to into the debt and into the economy. And so it's kind of a, well, there's a few things. I mean, the, the additional people on food stamps and welfare, they're keeping them from rioting, you know, and it's, uh, I don't know, it could be worse than it is, but we're going to pay for it in the end. We're going to pay for it all. And uh, the thing about it is I think what's going to happen is the same thing that happened in, in 1980. I think you're going to see, uh, you're going to see 98% of Republicans vote for Mitt Romney. There's going to be a few knuckleheads that, you know, are just diehard Santorum or whatever, Paul, whatever. They're going to either sit out or they're going to, I don't know what they're going to do, right in. But he's going to get the vast, vast majority. Everybody who is a Republican in the United States of America will be at the polling booth. I mean, I don't see how you can stay home unless it's some kind of physical ailment uh, this time around. So he's going to get that big block. Blacks are going to overwhelmingly go for Obama due to racial loyalty. I just, I feel that uh, it's, it seems to be when you listen to people, not all of them maybe, but at least 90%. But uh, I don't think it's going to be as much as it was the last time. I don't either. I don't think the turnout I, I, I will be as much. I think that everybody's going to, you know, th they may abstain. You may have, have a lot of, you know. I think you uh, will. People just not vote for anybody in, in, in lieu of voting for Obama, and then they can they don't have to say, "Well, I voted against him." Uh, but I, I don't think I don't see how um, anybody that that you know pays taxes and has a job can appreciate you know this whole well we're going to spread the wealth crap, and that's what it is. I think the only other vote besides. The leftists in the Democrat Party, the leftists in the Democrat Party, not the whole Democrat Party. I'm not finished yet. <laughs> but the leftists yeah, yeah. will vote for Obama. The recently graduated college students who haven't had enough life experience yet to realize that they were fed a, a, a bucket of shit when they were in school. Well, and, the ones recently graduated also are going to be going, hey, why can't I get a job? That's true. And they might break that way. But I'm, I'm just trying to the only people that will legitimately vote for Obama either aren't paying attention or are leftists or are recently propagandized in our universities. I think well, you're going to see the blue collar. I know a lot of Democrats and a lot of them are very intelligent and a lot of them are sitting at home going shit. And I think they're going to break big for Mitt Romney, just like they did in 1980. I think that the thinking man oh, yeah, who voted for Obama to, to be, to get elected, I can see how they got fooled the first time. With the way the coverage was, I was covering it. I had to actually change my other comedy show because during the Obama campaign, my comedy show about Pittsburgh ended up being a political rant because I, that, could, I couldn't believe it. And, and Still City Resistance was born. It was. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think they're going to break big. I think the Democrats in this country, the intelligent working class white Democrats, not to say anybody else is not intelligent, they're going to save this country. Well, I mean, you know, back in the 80s, they called them the Reagan Democrats. Exactly. Right? And, and it's basically they're going to be the Romney Democrats. You're going to have people that are going to go, OK, well, we gave this guy a shot. And he said, point blank, if I don't have the deficit cut in half by the end of my first term, you can call me former Mr. President. Well, former Mr. President Obama, you've d almost doubled the debt and the deficit. So. Uh, I'll be more than happy to call you former President Obama. And I just think that it's, I mean, there's a possibility. I don't think California is possible, and I don't think New York is possible. And maybe Washington, but he's going to, I think Romney is going to get in the high 40s of the, oh, of well, the states. It, I think that, that a lot of people are going to be shocked because the, the places that predominantly were Democratic strongholds are waking up. And like Wisconsin, Wisconsin's, yeah. you know, was a blue state all along, and it's become red with, uh, what's his name, uh, Scott? Rasmussen. 
No, 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 no. Scott, what's his name? The governor who just won the governor. Uh, you Walker. Know, where, where they just had the recall vote. Walker. And yeah, Scott Walker. And Democrats, you know, that was a blue state from the giddy up. And all of a sudden, they're turning red. And... Well, look at, look at the, the war they lost in Wisconsin. It was ugly when the unions were out there and spent millions of dollars. That was one of the most triumphant times in this country, I think. This is a movement. And I think what happened with the selection of Ryan and the way that Romney immediately went on the attack and told Obama to take his hateful, divisive campaign back to Chicago, I think that was where Romney joined the movement, now, at least for me. Know, you know what I'm think the, the what I'm thinking is right now because of uh, the way that campaign finance is set up, what Romney's doing is he's taking jabs. It's like a boxer, right? You know, you know what your guy's going to do, so you just take jabs, take jabs, and you just watch him react, watch him react, watch him react. Then once the general election comes up, once Romney's made the nominee, that's when the gloves come off. Yeah. And he's going to start throwing bombs. And it's going to be, okay, you know, because once again, you know, Obama Obama did the same thing to, to Hillary when he ran against her. Show us your, show me o your tax Obama returns. has done it in every single election he has ever been in. Him and Axelrod, if you look back at the state senatorial primaries, the state senatorial races, every every race he has ever been in, he managed with, with Gibbs and with uh, Axelrod with their, with their leverage at the Chicago Tribune Review, they managed to unseal sealed personal records of the opponents that he faced uh, twice in a row. I mean, yeah. his own Democrat uh, primary okay. opponent. Yep. You know, and I mean, they released garbage stuff like uh, that was a divorce decree was yeah. with the first guy. And the second guy, it was custody papers uh, that it ended up that the guy was – sexually deviant or something i mean he it wasn't yeah. deviant but he was, doing was stuff. Guy that, no he was a guy that was married to jerry ryan and uh, yeah yeah and, and then <laughs> alan i'm surprised that they haven't tried to tie paul ryan to jerry ryan uh, somehow well, they will they will but, but yeah. the, the, the good the good news is is that it's not working and the press hasn't figured it out yet see the press the washington press especially and all these politicians they're living insulated from everything that everybody else is feeling the six counties surrounding Washington, D.C. are the richest six counties. They're, they're six out of ten of the richest counties in the United States. There is no recession in Washington, D.C., in that area. Their kids are going to good schools. There's no blight. There's no foreclosure or anything like that. So they don't even realize that they're getting uh, undermined by us and tens of thousands of other small market shows like ours are out there we, we decided we're not dealing with them anymore it's not going to happen now we can't get on here every day and we don't have millions of of people following us but we have some you know and there's other shows we have a core we and, do. and that's that's and the thank idea. you ladies and gentlemen for for being our core i want to thank you right now from the bottom of my heart because this is educating me so much and ward i mean we would still look at this but not with the intensity that we do when we know we have to come to you on sunday yeah, because we, we kind of got to, to make sure that all our ducks are in a row and we're not talking some kind of crazy garbage. Right. But we have our our core that keeps coming back and keeps watching the show and downloading it, whatever. And hopefully they're going to start telling their friends and their friends will start telling their friends and it's going to yeah, grow. Yeah, please do. But the, the bottom line is, you know, we're doing this because we love our country. And Absolutely. we want our country to to progress and grow, for not for just our children, our children's children, and our children's children's children. And with this kind of of administration and you know driving the boat, we're going right over the waterfall. And, and we have to be ready for the coming confrontation with Islam. I mean, that's coming. No matter yeah. what anybody says, no matter what when anybody calls me. One of those seventh century son of a bitches is going to get nuclear weapons before long. And this administration and, and, and even the last administration wasn't real proactive in recognizing the enemy. Uh, and then on top of that, you have the president making appearances with People magazine and with Entertainment Tonight. And he was on the radio with like a morning one of those morning shows, you know, the DJ shows. 
-hmm. He hasn't stood for questions from the White House press corps, the Washington press corps, for like eight weeks. Yeah. That is unbelievable. I mean, that's... uh, I can't believe more of them aren't aren't uh, raising up about that. He's going to lose the press if he's not careful. I don't know if you noticed, but I posted something on the website or, or correction on Facebook. He lost Newsweek. If you look at the cover, matter of yeah. fact, the cover of Newsweek. I wonder if I get in any copyright problems with that. No, you. Can uh, that, that might be that might be this week's image, but the the president they told him to take a hike. Somebody new needs to be president. Newsweek, the one that said we were all socialists now when he won. You know, it's just totally uh, unbelievable. And I think this is, uh, again, I think this is Ryan coming through. And I think this has, has moved from a boring old white guy campaign into a movement that is going to fuse with the Tea Party. I think it already has fused with the Tea Party. I think the Paul Ryan nomination or, you know, yeah. the Paul Ryan pick really solidified the Tea Party because the, the the Tea Party is uh, all about fiscal responsibility, and that is basically and Paul fighting, Ryan's And fighting name. back. You're right. And and the yeah. thing is, is that Paul Ryan cannot win this race. Mitt Romney has to win this race. And I think it shows every every day that goes by. You know me. I was not a Romney fan, and I'm being I'm being sucked in. I can feel myself being sucked in. I'm watching this guy. He's got savvy. He's not. I thought he was just going to be like Thurston Howell. This guy can fight, and I think yeah. we're going to see it. And we're going to see it in the next few weeks, and it's going to be wonderful to watch. I mean, it it, it just is. It better be. <laughs> now, I, well, like I said, you know, between Joe Biden, you know, having to debate Paul oh, Ryan, yeah. he's going to look like uh, he's going to look as bad as anybody can possibly look. And I think that if the debates between Romney and Obama are also going to be good. Yeah. Because, you know, if he asks some point blank, what about the economy? You know, he, he can, he, Obama can talk about all the taxes and all that stuff that he wants, but the bottom line is when they get up there to debate, Romney's going to look at him in front of millions of people and say, what about the tax? I mean, yeah. what about the economy? Yeah. And he's going to, well, you didn't pay your tax. No, no, no. What about the economy? This is about everybody else. This isn't about me. The only and thing then if he was really me. smart, he'd say, you know what? I'll tell you what. I'll give you every tax that I ever turned in if you really, if you open up your collegiate records. Or give the Fast and Furious emails. Yeah, well, they'll never do that. But the thing because is. Because th- that would indict them. I, I uh, The only thing that makes me nervous is the the leftist media that they got to do the to do the debates. I, I, I don't still to this day don't understand why the, well, the RNC the doesn't they, try to do something to like, all right, get at least one guy in there that's that's uh, at least neutral. But the thing is, when they throw the lollipop questions, the lollipop questions go to Romney, too. Well, so also, that, it doesn't that, matter that would, what they ask, really. You can say whatever you want. Yeah. You know, they so ask I, a stupid question. He can change the subject on them. But and, and Romney's pretty good at that. Yeah, he is. You know, uh, I, I I'm kind of looking forward to watching the debates just oh, to I'm see uh, just to see how Obama because McCain never attacked him and I think that after uh, Romney gets the actual nomination that you're gonna wa- a, a see a totally different guy and you're gonna see somebody that's on the attack and Obama's deal is he always puts his opponent on a defensive and and is making them fight from their back foot. And Romney's not like that. Romney's right now just taking the, you know, taking the jabs, taking the jabs. And once the, uh, once the actual debates come down and he's actually the nominee, he's going to start throwing the punches. Oh, he's yeah. going to put Obama on the defensive. And Obama can't fight off his back foot. No, and he doesn't. He has such thin skin. And Romney's been studying this. You know, Romney has a staff yeah. that's been just studying this every inch of it. And he's going to make Obama look silly, I think. I really do. I mean, if if Gingrich and Santorum can't make Romney bow out, Obama damn sure can't. No. You know, uh, now there was an incident that happened on May 1st, which happens to be the communist holiday of May Day. Uh, it happened in Cleveland. And the Occupy Cleveland five, five guys from Occupy Cleveland, were going to blow up the Cuyahoga Bridge or some bridge, some big high-level bridge, in Cleveland and they got caught by the FBI and it was never, never mentioned in the media. 
And when no, it was mentioned, it was the Occupy movement. when it was mentioned, it, it was either terrorists or Occupy. It wasn't both. They, they never made the connection, and the connection was clear. One of the houses that some of the Occupy members were shacking up in was one of these guys' houses. And uh, anyway, there was an event yesterday. A couple thousand people gathered in Cleveland. I think they actually went to the bridge, too. Uh, they were going to blow up the Federal Reserve in Cleveland also, but they held an event called Occupy Truth, and like 2,000 people showed up. That's more than show up for Obama. Not near as much as show up for Romney, but more to show up for Obama. He's been having problems with his crowd size, and his people are saying that they're limiting them on purpose. Uh, so they're just telling the truth everywhere they go. Yeah. Well, in fact, there was another story that I meant to put in the show notes about Occupy that, once again, didn't make the press. Is There was a story that in Oakland, California, the Occupy movement, came in and occupied Obama's offices and weren't letting people in. And so they took the, you know, the, these, I guess, are the Occupy people that take the stuff seriously. Yeah. And they, they weren't, you know, they were like, okay, well, you know, you're also being backed by these big banks that we're opposing, so we're going to do the same thing. And they occupied Obama's offices. I, I want to say it was Friday. Yeah, it was one of those times where it was like, there's there's a certain time in the week that if a story happens, then it just never stands a chance in hell of getting on the show. Yeah, <laughs> just well, I because mean, they of have the time. A hostage negotiator and yeah. on yards to get him out of the that hardly had any press. No, I mean, of course it didn't because it was the Occupy movement. You know, the, the press here here's here's a barometer for the press. One is that Newsweek article. Another one, NBC, which is clearly the worst of the bunch. NBC. The Tonight Show with Jay Leno had to lay off 20 people from their staff, and Jay Leno had to take a, what was described as a massive pay cut just in order for the show to stay on. So it's working, ladies and gentlemen. The market is working. It's going to work. These guys are going out of business. We're going to run them right out of business. They might get a year or two extra because they killed David Breitbart, but... I'm telling you, somebody else is going to step up in Breitbart's place, and you guys are, you're on borrowed time. That's my opinion. Oh, no, and I agree with that. There, there's no way that, you know, it, social media and the new media is, is taking the place because you have people out there that are willing to, you know, speak the truth. And they don't have any ulterior motive or any other agenda, like this show. I don't have a, any agenda, and once... Uh, if Mitt Romney were to win the election, I would be as vigilant watching Mitt Romney do his thing as I am watching Obama. Oh, I'm definitely going to watch him. There's Republicans out there I can't stand that we got to get rid of. I mean, there's no but, question. That Baucus is one is, of them, Spencer not, Baucus. Everybody thinks for some reason that we're just this neocon no. uh, radio show and or internet show, and we're really not. Um I'm a conservative. I want what's right. I got kids. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna side with somebody because they say they're conservative. I'm gonna say, okay, if you're conservative, now prove it. Yeah. Show me. And if you don't, I'm gonna talk about it. But the actual mantle of leadership, I read an article, has actually shifted away from Obama. I mean, Obama had to send Joe Biden back to Delaware for the weekend, and he's never come out on anything policy oriented in months. Uh, and it just seems like Romney and, and Ryan have accepted the leadership mantle already. It's amazing. Uh, you listen to uh, Fox News Sunday, Chris Wallace. I've complained about this guy numerous times on the show. He had that freaking Chicago mob guy, Rob, Robert Gibbs. And Robert Gibbs and, and the other prominent as Democrats, especially from the campaign, Axelrod and most of them, their tactic is to when – when Chris Wallace or anybody else asks a question, they start talking so the audience can't hear what the question is or what the – he tried to go down another road when he was asked the question, and instead of letting him go down that road, Chris Wallace said, no, I, this is what I asked you, and that's when they talk. So you can't hear them, and they end up never answering the question or lying. So getting Chris Wallace back in the fight's about time too. That was my point. You know, he's been, uh, he's been weak. Yeah, well, and pretty much all the media's been weak, you know, with the exception of, you know, Hannity and, and Rush Limbaugh. And, I mean, and, and, you know, 
this kind of a fight is right in Hannity's wheelhouse. This is where he likes to be. So it's not, you know, that far off center for Sean Hannity to, 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 you know, they won't do Hannity's show because they know that Hannity will, it will call him on it every time and say, no, that's not what I said. Answer the question. And he'll press them and press them until they get mad and leave. And ladies and gentlemen, your weekly Jihad report, 11 to 17 August, 57 Jihad attacks, 7 Alwa Akbars, 289 dead bodies this week, and 603 critically injured. The religion of peace, one body at a time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this story is going to take a couple minutes if I can uh, even get through it, but if I can't, it's posted on the show notes links page. Uh, on the website, steelcityresistance.wordpress.com. Uh, and uh, this is uh, amazing. Ward and I were talking about this before the show. Uh, this is a show that absolutely should be in the media, and it's nowhere to be found. I found it on American Thinker, uh, a good a good author there, contributor, Jeffrey Lord. Uh, I just can't believe that this wasn't uh, reported anywhere else. This is going to stun you if you can follow it. Is Obama appointee the link between the Obama campaign and the Obama super PAC? Was Joe Soptic famous before he was famous? Did a member of the Obama administration bring Soptic to the attention of both the Obama campaign and the pro-Obama super PAC run by ex-Obama White House aide Bill Burton, which would formally tie the administration itself to the activities of the super PAC, a violation of federal election law? Let's get to this by starting with Leo Girard. Leo Girard, he would be a member of the Obama administration's Advisory Committee on Trade Policy and Negotiations, ACTPN. ACPTPN is a formal part of the, of the Office of the United States Trade Representative tasked by the 1974 Trade Act with the responsibility to provide the U.S. Trade Representative with policy advice. The U.S. Trade Representative is officially a member of the President's Cabinet, carrying the title of Ambassador. The current U.S. Trade Rep is Ambassador Ron Kirk. Kirk, a Democrat and Obama appointee, is the former mayor of Dallas, Texas, the city's first African-American mayor, and previously was the appointed Texas Secretary of State for the late Governor Ann Richards. I didn't know she died. Uh, the group can have as many as 45 members, all appointed by the president, and it is supposed to be bipartisan, with representatives of both parties serving as members. Among GOP members is New, is New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. But serving on ACTPN as an Obama appointee is not Gerard's day job. Gerard's day job would be his job as the international president of the United Steelworkers. The self-same union from which Steelworker Union member Joe Soptic emerged in the now infamous Obama Super PAC ad. Let's follow the breadcrumbs, shall we? First, let's begin with the basics. As all of America now knows, the Obama Super PAC has run an ad with former Steelworker Soptic essentially accusing Governor Romney of killing his wife. Uh, and it had a link. Also, as Sean Hannity has revealed, there appears to have been a close coordination between the Obama campaign and the Obama super PAC, a direct violation of federal election law. Obama spokesman Stephanie Cutter was caught out in a flat lie, saying she did not know the facts surrounding the death of Joe Soptic's wife. Hannity produced an audio tape of Cutter on a conference call from back in May with Soptic and reporters in which Soptic discussed exactly that, thanking a listener and participating thanking a listening and participating Cutter at the end of the call. In short, Stephanie Cutter was caught by Hannity delivering a flat-out lie to what she apparently assumed was a pliant, if not friendly, media. She looked the television cameras directly in the eye and lied. But there's something else here. The head of the Obama Super PAC is one Bill Burton, who is, of course, the former Obama White House Deputy Press Secretary. On February 16, 2011, Burton, who had lost out to Jay Carney in a bid to replace Robert Gibbs as White House press secretary, announced he was leaving the White House. But on September 15, 2010, Burton was still in his job as the White House deputy press secretary. On September 15, Leo Girard's appointment to the Trade Advisory Group was announced by, yes indeed, Office of the Press Secretary, said the White House of Girard in its release, Leo W. Girard, appointee for Member Advisory Committee for Trade Policy and Negotiations. Leo W. Girard 
is the international president of the United Steelworkers. He's a member of the AFL-CIO's executive committee and chairs its public policy committee. Mr. Gerard is co-chairman of the Blue-Green Alliance and a board member of the Apollo Alliance, Campaign for America's Future and Economic Policy Institute. In addition, he is a member of the executive committees of the IMF and ICEM Global Labor Federations. In conjunction with Unite the Union, Mr. Gerard was instrumental in creating Workers Uniting, the first global union. Which is to say, on September 15, 2010, the White House press office, where the deputy press secretary was one Bill Burton, was busy informing Americans of Mr. Gerard's appointment. Now, let's start with a question about Joe Soptic. Take a look at this. This shows a clip that he was in in a 2008 United Steelworkers convention that took place in Las Vegas. While no names are mentioned, clearly one of the stars is Union President Leo Gerard. A series of issues is flashed on the screen, one being health care, along with union members saying a buzzword here and there. At 1.20, there appears to be a man in a hard hat who looks remarkably like Joe Soptic, the now infamous union member who is everywhere accusing Mitt Romney of killing his wife. This man appears several more times in the video, and you can go to the show notes links and actually watch it. Uh, and then it shows where he, he shows up five or six times. In other words, if in fact that is Joe Soptic appearing in that 2008 Steelworkers video with Leo Gerard, it is more than conceivable that Gerard knew as far back as 2008 exa exactly who Joe Soptic was. So, so when Priorities USA, headed by ex-Deputy White House Press Secretary Bill Burton, was looking to smear Mitt Romney, Somehow, mysteriously, Burton learns of Joe Soptic, who seems to have appeared in a 2008 Steelworkers video with none other than Leo Gerard. The same Leo Gerard, who is both the president of the USW and a card-carrying presidential appointee of the Obama administration to the Obama administration's advisory committee on trade policy and negotiations. Thus, I turned to the United Steelworkers Union and asked the question, providing them with the YouTube link to their own video, I inquired as to whether that was in fact Joe Soptic in their 2008 video. And what do you think was the response? That's right, silence. Silencio. Nobody home at the USW except the chickens. And by the way, is there more to Leo Gerard than this? Is there more to the story of Bain Capital and GST, the plant at which Joe Soptic worked? Why, yes, indeedy. Let's compare two very interesting stories about GST. Here's the first, a reprint from the United Steelworkers about something that mysteriously never seems to get mentioned by the media in all their worship of the Soptic attack on Mitt Romney and Bain Capital. Now you got to hear this, ladies and gentlemen. This is the store. This is the steel mill that they were talking about Bain closing. You see, there was a strike at GST in 1997 by the United Steelworkers, a strike in which Joe Soptic presumably participated. When it was settled, the USW put out the press release linked above, and it is printed in its entirety. Kansas City, Missouri, June 13th, PRN Newswire. Members, members of local union 13 of the United Steelworkers of America overwhelmingly approved a new 66-month contract with GST Steel Thursday, June 12th, ending a strike that began on April 1st. The vote was 488 to 81. The agreement includes wage increases, bonuses, an increase in guaranteed pay to 40 hours a week from the current 32, worker involvement, major pension improvements, an organizing neutrality clause that prevents creation of runaway non-union subsidiaries, phase out of a two-tier wage system, and continuation of current restrictions on the contracting out of work. This contract meets and in some cases exceeds our industry pattern and serves the best interests of both our members and the company, said David Foster, director of USWA District 11 and chief negotiator for the union. We are especially gratified that we have achieved the neutrality clause that guarantees card check recognition at any new facilities in which the company has 40% interest, Foster added. That will prevent the kind of duplicity that LTV Steel committed against its workers in building a non-union plant in Alabama. GST also will guarantee under certain conditions card check recognition at any plants in which it holds a 15 to 40 percent interest. The agreement runs until October 1, 2002. There will be a limited economic reopener on June 1, 2000 with a binding arbitration if no settlement is achieved. GST is currently the country's largest producer of grinding media. Source United Steelworkers of America. Now, on May 14th of this year, Governor Romney began to secure the nomination and the Bain Capital issue gained steam. Our friends at National Review Online 
ran this item on the Romney Bain GST steel issue by Katrina Trinko. Trinko's story about what we now know to be the first ad featuring Soptic, which did not accuse Romney of killing his wife, that came later in the Super PAC ad from Burton, was read by a one-time GST steel worker who wrote the following, which is posted by NRO as an update to Trinko's story. I nearly choked on my Cheerios when I read that GST employees were blaming Bain for their downfall. I worked at GST Steel in Kansas City for four months in 1997, immediately after leaving the Navy. Why only four months? Quickly after I started, I was surprised to learn that several of my fellow USW Local 13 represented employees, mostly millwrights and electricians, were making between $100,000 and $130,000 a year. This was mainly due to union-mandated overtime, which at least on a few occasions consisted of the employees bringing in sleeping bags and pillows and sleeping in the shop. It would be hard for any company to stay competitive while paying double-time union wages to get their beauty sleep, but that's not the half, that's not the half of it. The union employees obviously didn't think they had it easy enough, so they went on strike in March of 97. The plant shut down for a couple of weeks until it restarted. Under the operation of management and non-union workers, the strike lasted a couple more months. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to go and finish this. There's, there's like eight more pages, and I'm running out of show time. Uh, but it's it's just incredible. This story was ruined from the inside out. This this mill was ruined from the inside out, and there's and there's collusion between the administration and the super PAC, which is strictly forbidden. So it's something to check it out. Check it out. It's the first story on the show notes links page. And uh, what do you think about that, Ward? That's just, uh, I can't believe they couldn't have dug into that a little bit harder. I, I, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, you know, all the shady and underhanded stuff that, that this, that the Obama campaign has done from the get-go, from way back when they were doing it, you know, when he was running for Senate, all the way up to where he was running for president, you know, the Tony Resco stuff, you know, that got swept under the rug. History's not going to treat this administration well at all, and I don't think the law is either. I think when this all comes, I think everybody's still drunk that this stuff's happened. I rattled off a couple things that this administration has done in three years, and when you look at it on a list of paper, it just stuns you. If it was any other country in the world, it would clearly be called a communist takeover. I mean, when you nationalize health care, the industry, the finances, education, mortgages, everything, I mean, there's not much left. Well, basically, that's what the Nazis did. Exactly. Uh, and the communists. But uh, at any rate, this next story, Ward, I looked at it, and at first I thought it was comedic until you read it all the way and figure out the true ramifications. Yeah. Uh, the ex apparently, the executive branch has a poor problem. Alan Dulles, the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, wrote in The Craft of Intelligence, sex and hard-headed intelligence operations rarely mix well. Perhaps the boys at the Pentagon need a refresher course. In this past week, the, Pentagon, the Pentagon's Missile Defense Agency warned its staff not to view porn on U.S. government computers. The Pentagon also released a, a report in, on April's Secret Service Colombian scandal, and the two are connected. In April, I said the Colombian scandal exposed a national security problem, the epidemic of U.S. government employees viewing porn, child porn, on government networks. I suggested readers type in Transportation Security Administration or U.S. State Department, Pentagon, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement and child porn into a Google search field to understand the scope. I neglected to include Missile Defense Agency. Bloomberg quotes a cybersecurity expert saying the Missile Defense, Missile Defense Agency's use of porn is concerning because many pornographic websites are infected and criminals and foreign intelligence services such as Russia use them to gain access and harvest data. How does this relate to President Obama's leadership problem? The Colombian scandal was the president's wake-up call. The White House needed to to order an in-depth and urgent investigation into porn, child porn, and prostitution in all government agencies. Mr. Obama did no such thing. 
Now, America's Missile Defense Agency may be exposing the core of our national security. So grave and unpatriotic is this violation, it may border on treason. Yet, Mr. Obama remains unconcerned. Members of Congress are so alarmed by the president's behavior that they recently passed an amendment preventing the administration from sharing missile defense technology with Russia. The Missile Defense Agency may have done so already. Thomas Jefferson once said he feared for this country when he reflected that God was just, I too fear for this country. No one is home in the Obama White House, and the Russians know this. Alan Dulles must be rolling in his grave. Americans should be extremely concerned. Yeah, that's an open gateway. And some of the things that he's done uh, aren't just domestic. I mean, with the with the missile shield. In uh oh, Eastern I mean, we Europe. could go on and on with the missile shield, with the the lack of any sort of global leadership in, in Egypt and in, in the whole Arab Spring thing. He did absolutely nothing except sat on his hands and allowed the Muslim Brotherhood to take over uh, Egypt, it's who who then basically is is an affront to our allies in Israel. Uh, so now Egypt's lobbing shells into, into Israel. You know, Syria is, is going to be a mess. And Syria, I'm sure, has some of the, uh, when uh, we went into Iraq, a lot of the weapons that they had made their way into Syria. So I'm sure there's a lot of ugly, nasty stuff in Syria, like mustard gas and, sure. and chemical weapons of that and sort. And we, we even have a story on this, but we're not going to be able to get to it. This is going to be your first, Warden, but that last one was just a little too long of mine. But they're actually taking, now listen up, people, with, members of the press that are all apologetic for the Muslim Brotherhood, let me explain something to you about what's going on in Egypt right now. They're going into press, opposition press, opposed to the Sharia-compliant bullshit that's going on now. They are dragging these people out of their studios, and they are literally crucifying them on trees. Think about that. These 7th century uncivilized mobs are crucifying people. That's stunning to me. I mean, and no press, nothing. And, and well, see, the thing is, and then they're going to claim that it, it's, uh, if you try and stop them, you're trying to step on their freedom of religion because that's part of their religion. <laughs> that's in the Quran. Oh, yeah. That, that anybody who, you know, who is against Islam has to be, you know, crucified. It's unreal. It's sickening. And, uh, Ward, I'm going to have to give you the ball again. we got some uh, developments in the Fast and Furious situation, and this is a story I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, Daryl Issa is going to – well, actually, this happened last Monday that Daryl Issa was uh, going to sue Eric Holder. Uh, House Oversight and Government Reform Chairman Daryl Issa plans to sue Attorney General – Eric Holder on Monday for refusing to provide documents related to the Fast and Furious gun smuggling operation. The committee expects, the uh, expects to file the civil contempt suit against the Attorney General Monday, a Republican source said. The suit will be filed in federal district court for the District of Columbia. The action is the latest escalation in the dispute between Haas Republicans and the Justice Department over the documents which relate to a botched gun smuggling operation. I'll tell and, you, it never goes away. This thing just nah, never, never goes and, away. And I keep waiting for, you know, for the other shoe to fall. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's is out there going, okay, give us documents, give us documents. And they give them a bunch of documents that are obsolete. And, and you know, they were from a, a, a gun running operation that, that was run under the Bush administration, Operation Wide Receiver. But what was all documented was done with under the uh, in conjunction with the Mexican government, in opposed to Fast and Furious that was done without their knowledge, without anything. They just slid it in and you know figured everything was going to be okay. Now when Brian Terry gets killed, oh well, we, we're going to have to do something about it. So they try and sweep everything under the rug. Uh, I don't, I don't see how they it, thought you know, they were going to be able to do that. I mean, I, I just don't. They. Uh, and now you got the guy, we're going to have to watch his court case in October if he isn't dead yet. I mean, the, the guy from the Sonola cartel. Uh, it's just, uh, it's amazing the way this important stuff is, is just uh, brushed under the rug by these people. I mean, they're complicit. I've, I've been saying it, it's almost to the point 
where after this election, something has to be done about this media. And I don't know what you do with the media and not be totalitarian. I don't know what the what the answer is, but this must be remedied. This has to well, be fixed. Hutch, it's, it's really simple. It, it, it's And you said it at the beginning of the show. It's managed through capitalism. Yeah. You, you know, in, instead of watching, you know, the mind-numbing shows on NBC and CBS, you know, watch us on, on the Internet. <laughs> over and, and over. Over and over again. <laughs> because that, that's the thing. I mean, no, they make right. their money right. from advertisers. And, and if people start turning them off and going, you know what? I'm not going to pay attention to the to the NBC evening news and if they're or the laying CBS evening off, news because they're garbage. If they're laying people off at NBC, there's a problem because NBC, I mean, the, the Tonight Show or whatever the hell it's called, that Jay Leno show, yeah, is one of their top show. money makers. Well, you that, know, it, that does part, get watched. Part of it was because they had to pay Conan O'Brien $32 million to leave. Right. Oh, it's going to be, I can't wait. I, I'll tell you what they ought to do. Glenn, I know you listen to the show, Glenn Beck, but uh, you need to hold one of your rallies around the networks, around the actual buildings, clog those streets, totally stop commerce in that whole area or something like that or do some. I don't know what you do, but it, it's it's got to be uh, something like that. Now, another story in the news uh, that's not in the news, it's in our news. Uh, we have a story here uh, about the auto bailout that has actually got – uh, new material. Uh, right now, they're saying that the Treasury is, uh, the, you know, the U.S. Treasury is going to lose, which is us, is going to lose $25 billion on the auto bailout. But then I heard stories in the middle of the week, Ward, that the uh, auto industry, or GM, is asking for another bailout. They're going to yeah. go bankrupt again. I, th I say let them go bankrupt. That is how capitalism works absolutely there you know, has to be losers it, it's survival of the fittest if they can't get their house in order and and they can't get the unions under control and they can't do this stuff then they fail that that would be like any other business in the country it, it has nothing this too big to fail garbage isn't right. true it's because like they're not too big to fail because they're failed if steel city resistance only had five viewers we failed and we're going to stop doing the show you know yeah. i mean that's just the way it is we're not going to put forth the effort that's that's just a kind of a, a goof around thing, but it's true. If nobody listened to this show, I wouldn't talk. You know, I just wouldn't. Uh, something's going on with the RAN that is uh, it's uh, not very calming. No, but it's it, it's very uh, it, it's something that would be very expected. And man, Iran admits giving WMDs to terrorists. Israel will be obliterated by chemical, microbial, microbial, and microbial, excuse me, chemical, microbial, and nuclear bombs, Iran is warning. But those weapons of mass destruction will be used on Tel Aviv by Hezbollah and Islamic Jihad at the start of the decades-old Muslim dream of, destroy, of destroying the Jewish state. An alarming commentary made last week in Mashgra the media outlet of Iran's revolutionary guards confirmed the Islamic regime has the Islamic regime not only has WMDs but has armed terrorist proxies with them. Uh, Mass Grosh, <laughs> I, I get the worst words. NBC, Mas, yeah, uh, <laughs> speaks for the regime. It's it warned Israel that fighting in Syria does not stop an all out attack on the Jewish state will be launched at that at zero hour. Tel Aviv will be the first city to be destroyed. Well, all I can say is you got to take them. You got to take fanatics at their word. Uh, I, I don't doubt them one little bit. Uh, they better if they're going to do it, they better do it before November, uh, which I hope they don't. I, I hope we don't get a distraction. I, I just have such little faith in the mobsters that are running the government right now that I would no, feel that they would not hesitate to, to sacrifice. I just, I'm not going to get into detail, but I, I just uh, have a real bad feeling about this October. I, the thing is, in, you know, if, if that's what it is, the October surprise is actually the Iranians attacking Israel. What, what's going to happen? This president isn't going to go and stand by Israel's side. This this president isn't going to. I mean, it's not going to cause 
any sort of retaliation on the on the United States part. He said from the beginning that he, you know, he doesn't care about Israel. He might he allow has, them. He might allow them to attack. He's Just, the only president who hasn't been to Israel. Yeah, and uh, still to this day, uh, I don't know how high level people in the federal government would take that. I don't know uh, because we've never been here before. We've never been. Jimmy Carter was kind of there, but not like this, not with nuclear weapons involved and a real chance of an Israeli loss, which I'm not even so sure that they would lose. But uh, even in a six-day war, they needed Nixon to uh, just uh, give them a massive amount of military aid. I remember seeing the films of the Howitzers unloading and everything. So we're going to have to watch yeah. that. It's it's not fun to talk about. It's really not. That's uh, That has an end result that is... Uh, unpredictable to say the least i mean well, if the uh, you know, strait of hormuz closes i mean it's just uh that's a regional war and there might be a regional war over there anyway because the military and egypt egypt's government are not seeing eye to eye i mean he just did a purge of the top level commanders of the egyptian army that were like holding the lid on it and now they're crucifying people well i i would hate for anything to happen However, if if Iran, you know, is has a brain in it, well, I I need a dinner jacket to have a brain in his head. I don't think he's running but, anything. I think the mullahs are. I think he's just a loudmouth. But if they pull the trigger and and launch some sort of a, a chemical or biological or nuclear attack on Israel. The entire country of Iran will glow in the dark for the next 10,000 years. If they give the word, if they give, that has to come from the president. Well, I really don't. I mean, if, if there is an attack, it doesn't matter who does it. If Hezbollah does it, if Syria does it, if, if anybody does it, because Iran has come out and said, we supplied it. Yeah. It, the Israelis are going to make that place glow because Israelis oh, yeah. have nuclear yeah, weapons. You're right. You're right. Uh, yeah, but it's uh, the Arab Spring takeover of Egypt by the Muslim Brotherhood has run amok with reports from several different media agencies that the radical Muslims have begun crucifying opponents of newly installed President Mohamed Morsi. Middle East media confirm that during a recent rampage, Muslim Brotherhood operatives crucified those opposing Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi naked on trees in front of the presidential palace while abusing others, and it is not on the news. That is not on the news, ladies and gentlemen. You are being ripped off. Well, here, here's, the, here's the line that I thought was interesting. It says, crucifixion is a had punishment. Stipulated in the Quran, Sarah, I guess that's chapter 5, verse 33, and therefore an obligatory part of Sharia, Lopez said, it's not it's been a traditional punishment within Islam since the beginning, even though it's not exclusively Islamic. The Romans used it too. The Christians are in serious trouble because the Quran in Surah 929 commands Muslims to wage war against them and subjugate them. And they're also identified with the hated West in the U.S., said Geller. And she also turns to 533. Islamic hardliners, these are Islamic hardliners who do everything by the Quran. The Quran says, indeed, the penalty for those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive upon earth to cause corruption is none but that they be killed or crucified or that their hands and feet be cut off from opposite sides or that they be exiled from the land, Geller said. I'll pick exile if it's me, <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, it's animalistic. It's sickening, you know, and it's not a... Uh, I don't see how you could be somebody that's not an ideologue and be in the news media. I, I just don't see how you could. Yeah, because, I mean, the, the, this should, everybody on the, you know, at least in the United States should know that this stuff's going on. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, because it, it, it's not, you know, like, you know, Egypt's not the ally that they once were. You know, they were an ally when Mahatma Begum was there, and they were an ally when Mubarak was there. You know, even though Mubarak was a son of a bitch to his people, that had absolutely nothing to do with us. He was still loyal to us, and he still upheld the, the peace accord with with Israel. As soon as the, the, you know, Muslim Brotherhood got in, you know, stuff started turning bad. You know, and, and part of it is, and 
we talked about this last week. That that chick that works for Hillary Clinton. More and more stuff's coming out every Uma week. Uma Abedin, and you ought to you ought to see the opposition that I get on Twitter and Facebook about that. Not so much yeah. not so much Facebook, but on Twitter, there are loyalists to these people that have been in Washington, and they just swear to God this freaking enemy of the state is a patriotic American, and it's not possible. A freaking Muslim like that connected to the Muslim Brotherhood cannot marry a Jew unless it's a plan. And just to clarify, Menachem Begin was the prime minister of Israel, not Egypt. Just to, uh, I, I'm, I, yeah, I, I didn't want to get all the, my mailbox. You know, who I meant. You, you know how the mailbox gets, and it's just. Uh, yeah, you, you know who I meant. I'm sorry. It's, it was Anwar Sadat. Yeah, yeah, there he is. I, it took me a second to remember. It and was Nasser, Sadat. Nasser before that, I think. Was it Nasser? I, I don't remember. I remember Sadak got blown up, and that's how Mubarak became the... And those were Muslim Brotherhood people. And I think the blind sheik was involved in that, the one that they're trying to get out of prison, that Morsi's trying to watch. He'll, they'll be extraditing him back to Egypt, and he'll be living a life like the guy in, in, uh, in Libya. No, he's dead. Yeah. No, oh, is he? Did he die? Yeah, he died. Cancer? Or somebody killed him? No, he had cancer. Did... And he was supposed to be end stage. But what's funny is... The Obama administration had knowledge of this prior oh, really? to his release. Yeah, that's great. They allowed that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for letting us into your life for an hour. We truly appreciate it and appreciate all of our listeners and viewers. Feel free to let us know how you feel. SCRTV at live.com. Send us an email. Call the show. I know there was uh, one viewer that was uh, last week wanted to call in. 412-254-3750. We're not currently equipped to take calls online and there was a, some kind of a problem uh, with the live stream tonight i apologize for that that's going all wacky and uh what may happen i may try to find another client to to stream with or we may just uh shit can that all together we don't get a whole lot of people uh, on the live stream we get a lot of people that download it at their own leisure which you can do at itunes or uh steelcityresistance.wordpress.com uh, the links are out on twitter and facebook and everything like that and what do you have as parting parting words to the resistance ward? Uh, I have absolutely no, no parting words whatsoever, sir. I am over and out. Okay, we'll see you next week. Thanks for thanks for having us in. You surprised me with that parting words thing. I was like, ah, oh, shit, I don't know what to say. No, the, pe the, people, <laughs> the people on SCR TV got an extra outtake. I'll see you, Warden.